Hi, and thanks for tuning in. My name is Rich Campbell. I'm Vice President of Global Clinical Trial Planning and Alliance Management at Bristol Myers Squibb, and I'm really pleased to welcome you to today's discussion. The COVID-19 pandemic has changed the way we think about a great number of things and has put new spotlight on others. Among those is a much greater awareness of the existence of clinical trials. The media coverage of clinical trials has never been greater, and general awareness has increased about the role that they play in evaluating the safety and efficacy of medicine before it's approved for use in the broad population. But what happens when clinical trials don't include all segments of the population that the medicine is intended to benefit? Especially when some diseases disproportionately affect specific races, genders, or age groups. How do we really know how effective those medicines will be in the real world if those groups aren't part of the testing and statistics? Now, despite years of efforts, clinical trials still lack significant diverse representation, both from the side of patients and clinical trial investigators, driven in part by insufficient awareness and access as, as well as trust. At BMS, we recognize that we have an opportunity and a responsibility to drive change towards eliminating those in inequities. So we've committed $150 million to accelerate diversity, equity, and inclusion efforts. And the Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation has independently committed its own 150 million to address these issues. Our research community um, has a unique opportunity to address these gaps and to work together um, towards a common objective, which is providing the opportunity of clinical trials to anyone who wishes to participate. So I'm really pleased to have two wonderful panelists here with me today to provide their perspective and to help us take a, a deeper dive into these barriers and, and opportunities. Uh, Dr. Aisha Langford is an assistant professor in the Department of Population Health and co-director of the Clinical and Translational Science Institute Recruitment and Retention Corps at the NYU Grossman School of Medicine. She studies how health communication can improve individual decision-making and reduce population health disparities for conditions or behaviors that lead to preventable mortality and, and morbidity. She's done work in cancer prevention and clinical trial participation in community-based settings. And her research has expanded to include cardiovascular disease broadly, with a particular interest in hypertension-related decision-making. So welcome, Dr. Langford. Thank you. And Maya Duesenberry um, is a journalist, editor, and author of the book, Doing Harm, the truth about how bad medicine and lazy science leave women dismissed, misdiagnosed, and sick. The book was a New York Times editor's choice pick and named one of the best books of 2018 by NPR and Library Journal. It was also the winner of the 2019 Minnesota Book Award for general nonfiction. Maya has been interviewed about gender bias in medicine on NPR's Fresh Air, Good Morning America, and countless radio shows and, and podcasts. And she regularly gives talks on the subject to students, healthcare providers, patient advocates, researchers, and biomedical industry employees. So welcome, Maya. Pleased to have uh, both of you here today. Thank you. So I, I'd like to start by talking a little bit more about why clinical trial diversity matters especially for those in the audience who may not be as familiar with this aspect of healthcare. So Aisha, what are some of the reasons you have seen for the lack of diversity in clinical trials? That's a great question. I am a big proponent of making sure that people are actually asked. So one of the reasons that there's a lack of diversity in clinical trials is that oftentimes different segments of the populations. One, are not aware that clinical trials are available. And secondly, they're not ever explicitly asked. So I think that's a really important thing to keep in mind. You mentioned earlier that mistrust is an issue for uh, many segments of the population, not all. Uh, typically, the issue about mistrust or distrust in healthcare organization is often framed as uh, folks who are part of minority groups and that it is an issue, but that's not an issue for every single person who's a minority. Uh, mistrust is also a concern for uh, some other members of the population as well. And I think another issue with regard to diversity is how protocols are written. And oftentimes protocols can be very stringent, 
or not really designed with patients in mind. And so the burden of being in a, a clinical trial can be overwhelming or just too much for many folks in the population. So if you think about older adults, people who have cognitive decline, or if, even if you think about gender differences, if a protocol, for example, is trying to target young mothers or pregnant women, but the only times that people can come in are on Tuesday afternoons or Thursday afternoons between 2 and 5 p.m. That can be prohibitive for people who may be interested. So there are a variety of different reasons, and those are just a few. Themes that, that we have, have heard and seen around kind of combinations of, of trust and awareness, um, and then are you actually designing trials that are, that are conducive to people being able to participate in? I guess just have you have you seen any changes in that regard either over time or specifically recently um, that that you can share? I think in general the issue of awareness around protocol burden and participant burden, I have seen that being more talked about and published in the literature. I will say at my own institution, I do a lot of consultations with study teams and I've been pleasantly surprised that many study teams are now coming in early in the process to get a consultation. So historically, what many investigators would do is to think of a research project, write a protocol, hopefully get it funded by NIH or a pharmaceutical company, then get an RRB approval at their own institution. And then they realize maybe a year in or two years in that they have a problem because maybe the protocol is too restrictive or people just don't want to do it. And I'll also mm -hmm. add that I have seen more patient advisory councils and community advisory boards being utilized by healthcare organizations and study teams more often. And I think that's definitely a step in the right direction. Great. Thanks for sharing. And it's good to hear. And I think it's kind of bringing that kind of thinking earlier in the in the process and even kind of changing the, the vocabulary and understanding about those things. Um, certainly helpful. So thank you. Um, Maya, can 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 I turn to you? Um, in your your mid twenties, uh, you were you were diagnosed with rheumatoid arthritis. Uh, you know, an experience that it, it inspired you um, to explore gender bias in medicine. Can you tell us a little bit about how you became interested in this topic and what your research has unveiled about female inclusion in drug trials, as well as uh, medical observational studies? Yeah, absolutely. So yeah, when I was diagnosed with RA, I had been a feminist journalist who had covered a lot of reproductive health, health issues for a while. But when I became sick, I realized that I really hadn't given too much thought to how much gender bias could affect medical care beyond reproductive health issues. And as I sort of delved into the research, I quickly realized that one of the big problems we're facing is that there's just this big knowledge gap when it comes to women's health. And in part, that's because a lot of women's health conditions, like autoimmune diseases like RA, have just been under-researched entirely. But it's also because of the result of these long decades where women were really underrepresented or outright excluded from a lot of clinical research. Um, you know, this problem was, of course, really put firmly on the public's radar for the first time in the early 90s. Um, at that time, there were you know, large foundational studies that were enrolling thousands of men and, and zero women. Um, the FDA had a policy explicitly prohibiting uh, women of childbearing potential from taking part in early phase drug trials. And there was really this kind of general reluctance to enroll women that was rooted in part in concern about fetal harm, but um, was also about this sort of belief that women's varying hormonal states and cycles would kind of complicate results, and it was considered just kind of easier to study men and extrapolate those results to women. And we've certainly made a lot of progress in, in the years um, and decades since, but, you know, one of the things that I learned is still, you know, an ongoing issue is that while women are really usually included in studies these days, it still hasn't totally become the norm for researchers to always analyze their results by gender and to actually include those analyses in their published journal articles on their work. Um, you know, when I was doing my research, some of the experts I spoke to about this described this as a sort of add women and stir approach, where yes, women are included, but we're still really not gaining as much knowledge as we could be about how their symptoms or response to treatment may differ from men's. Um, and that's really just become 
more and more unjustifiable over the decades because we've also been gaining all of this new knowledge about how um, you know there often are important differences in everything from side effects and effectiveness of drug treatments to symptoms and risk factors for the same disease. Um, but we're really still just kind of playing catch up to really truly understanding those kind of things. Great, yeah, and I think you know, for for me, it's inspiring to hear about how this kind of personal experience led you to kind of think broadly, research, and and really you know look to enact change. And I certainly hear what you're saying about how there's been improvement, but there's still more and 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 lots to do. I, I, Aisha, if I, if I could turn back to you for a minute. Um, as, as someone who has done work in clinical trial participation in community-based settings, what do you see as some of the, the most promising solutions to help achieve the, the goals there of enrolling more diverse patients? Yes, uh, so that's a, another great question. I did my uh, PhD in dissertation work actually at the University of Michigan, and as part of my dissertation, I actually worked with Black churches. One of the promising solutions is to have that community engagement and patient engagement and stakeholder engagement early on. Stakeholder engagement also can mean a lot of different things. That might be, depending on the situation, partnering with a women's focused community health center. In other cases, that might be partnering with a federally qualified health center. It's really important to have stakeholder engagement throughout the process and not really just to be relying exclusively on a PI or a study team to be driving the whole project. Have, have you seen major differences in, in approaches that that are effective in those community-based settings versus something like a large academic center? Right, so one of the, the reasons that community-based partnerships can be in fact effective is because the many times people will trust the folks that they see every day. So you may be familiar with the term uh, community health workers, and that has been utilized by some study teams. And that's really where you're working with representatives in the community who are familiar with the community. Another strategy that is used within health systems sometimes, especially larger academic medical centers that have a, a electronic health system like Epic, there are now opportunities where you can invite patients directly or direct to consumer mm -hmm. invitations through things like MyChart. One caveat there is that not all patients are using the electronic health record systems and patient portals like my chart. I think generally it's growing, but there are some socio-demographic differences. So if you are going to use that at your own home institution, it's just a good idea to know who's actually using it. So you have a sense of if you need to supplement that outreach with other mechanisms like literally old school phone calls or doing mailings or maybe direct emails to people. Certainly, um, no kind of single approach that works ac across the board, and, and and need to think about different ways in, in different in different settings. So thank you so much, um, Maya. In, in your book, Doing Harm, you know, you make the case that women's symptoms are often dismissed and, and misdiagnosed in part to in part due to what you call systemic and unconscious bias that's learned in medical school. So in your opinion, how does education need to evolve around the ways uh, female responses to treatment might differ from men? Yeah, right. So in my book, in addition to kind of exploring this knowledge gap when it comes to women's health, I also delve into what I call the trust gap. So that's this tendency to um, dismiss or minimize and especially to psychologize reports of their symptoms. And in the book, I get pretty deep into kind of the roots of this bias in the history of hysteria. Um, but for me, really one of the biggest takeaways of my research was that this knowledge gap and this trust gap are really mutually reinforcing. So the sort of less that we know about women's health, the more medicine will have this tendency to kind of try to explain away those gaps in knowledge by just attributing women's unexplained symptoms to just being all in your head. Um, so for example, a woman may be experiencing symptoms that are in fact side effects from a drug that was largely studied in men. Um, but if that's not recognized as such, you know, she may be dismissed and that just kind of reinforces the stereotype that women are prone to psychogenic symptoms or unexplained symptoms. 
Um, but I think also, you know, even more simply than that, I think it would be really helpful for future doctors to get more education about this history of gender bias and the existence of this knowledge gap and to really realize that, you know, it hasn't been that long that we've even been trying to close that gap. Um, you know, I think that could go a long way towards, you know, helping so that doctors um, may be less likely to sort of be dismissive when faced with women's unexplained symptoms and instead really see them as a reflection of how much more we still need to learn about women's health. Great. Yeah, no, fully, fully agree. And I guess, you know, a, a question that I asked earlier, is this an area where you have seen improvement, um, you know, recognizing that there's probably still a long way to go? Have you seen kind of specific examples of where this has been applied and, and is, is starting to work? Yeah, I mean, I think there's certainly been, a, of course, a lot of efforts to get sort of information about sex and gender differences better integrated into medical schools. Um, I'm also really optimistic that, you know, as more and more women kind of share their experiences with this, you know, what I call this trust gap and, and mm -hmm. really talk about how hard it is to get diagnosed sometimes and how dismissed they felt, um, that that has really started to kind of raise awareness um, about that problem, you know, in the media and in social media. Um, and hopefully those kind of stories can help help spur some sort of introspection um, within the profession about how to um, ameliorate those kind of harms. So I, I'd actually like to hear from from both of you on, on my next question. Um, what would you say to, to companies like mine, like Bristol Myers Squibb, and our peers in, in the biopharma space as we continue to, to make the changes necessary to ensure that clinical trials reflect um, the, the racial, ethnic, and, and gender diversity of, of the patients we serve? What, what, we, what would you tell companies like, like ours? Hey, Maya, maybe I could start with you? Sure. Um, yeah, I think one thing I'd say is to really remember that the point is not just sort of diversity for diversity's sake or inclusion for inclusion's sake. Um, you know, the reason it's so important to enroll both men and women and to pay attention to the possibility that there are differences between the two is really to improve medical care for both genders, um, as well as to just sort of advance medical knowledge more generally and, and give us better understandings of the human body. And I think it's important to remember that for women, this is especially important because of the historical neglect of women's health. Um, and so I think I'd, I'd say that the farm industry and the biomedical research community more broadly um, should also really be kind of motivated by that larger goal of just kind of closing that knowledge gap when it comes to women's health. Um, and doing that, I think, you know, is really will require more than just kind of checking off the box that, you know, we included X number of women in a particular study, but really thinking more deeply about things like what are the questions we haven't asked? What are the areas that are still really understudied? And how can we really sort of engage more with patients and patient communities to design research that um, is, is following their lead in, in thinking about what will better serve them? And I the same question to you. Yes, I totally agree with everything Maya just said. I would also raise the question of what do we actually mean by diversity? So diversity can mean a lot of different things. So diversity could mean we're getting patients from different medical settings, right? Academic medical centers versus federally qualified health centers. It could be diversity in terms of health conditions that are actually represented in the research. Diversity could have to do with age and making sure we're having people across the lifespan, not just healthy 25 year olds, but that we have men and women who are over 65 um, in their later years. Um, I would also say that there is a lot of talk about racial and ethnic diversity, which I do think is important, but race uh, is a social construct. And so sometimes that gets conflated with okay, if we have enough African-Americans and Hispanic adults and Asian adults, then we can make inferences about biological differences or genetic differences. And we know that that's not based in science. Um, but the, the social justice aspect is that kind of the idea of with research ethics that you want the risk and benefits of research to be fairly distributed across the population. So the idea 
around equity and justice would be that people who want to participate should have the opportunity to participate. And that has to do with equity and who's aware of the trials, who's asked. And if the protocol is not so overly restrictive that whole groups of people aren't able to get into it. So those are some of the things that I would suggest. And then also, I think Maya touched upon this, really making sure that the populations of interest and the populations that may most benefit from that research are included early on in the process and have a voice. Uh, In addition to the biomedical and physical outcomes, which are usually the main outcomes of the study team, that the uh, quality of life and other kind of concerns of patients and families and communities, many times they're not necessarily worried about, okay, did the blood pressure go up three or four points? They may be worried about, okay, does this medication or this protocol impact like my physical functioning or how I feel every day? So I think it's important to have that patient and community voice to understand what things are we missing that are important to the communities that will benefit from this research. Great. No, no, and and all great uh, advice. So thank you both um, for for that. Uh, I I guess I just have one last question um, for for both of you, which is, uh, you know, kind of about about the moment that we're in, right, with the um, the the pandemic and the racial justice movement, bringing kind of new urgency and attention to inequities, um, including in healthcare. You know, how can how can the industry and, and and the community really seize this moment in a way that we can affect long term positive change? Um, and Aisha, maybe I'll start with you on this one. Sure. So it's going to sound a little bit flip, but I think Einstein said, if you want different results, you can't keep doing the same thing over and over. And so I am encouraged that there's so much awareness around health disparities and health inequities. Uh, But we all know that those aren't new issues. And so many companies last year, and I guess maybe still this year, have done statements about, you know, social justice is important and we all need to kind of combat all of these things. So I'll be really interested a year from now and three years from now and five years from now if those companies actually follow through with real action. But I do think it, it is really important to kind of think about the root causes of many of these things. And so even how uh, biomedical companies fund research, uh, rich researchers, they're you know, making grants available to you, making sure that you have investigators of color and women and investigators with a variety of backgrounds getting grants to conduct research. And then also kind of back to the protocol development side of things, where you open up a trial has huge implications for who can participate. The... Um, the parameters around the study visits and what's required, that whole patient burden, that may have huge implications for people who are older adults or women who have children or women in general or women who are pregnant. I think Maya touched upon, I I understand the concern sometimes of not wanting to include pregnant women right away, but pregnant women get illnesses, pregnant women have to get vaccines, pregnant women, all the things that we deal with in the world, pregnant women have to deal with as well. And so you could make the argument that unless there's a really good, you know, physical reason or logistical reason to exclude pregnant women, that maybe we should not be doing that either, that maybe we should maybe rethink how we do our trials in in the same way with pediatrics and adults, maybe we should think about um, having that in parallel as well, so that we're not always playing catch up when it comes to women's health. Great, thank you. And and Maya, same question to you. Yeah, yeah, I mean, it really does seem like the pandemic has just been exposing so many inequities and systemic problems that have long been there in, in so many realms, but um, have just made things like disparities in underlying health and inequities when it comes to access to health care, and then also the biases that can often affect the delivery of that care, making all of those things so much more clear. Um, I think this moment is really unprecedented, too, in the fact that the public is, you know, watching science happen in real time in, in this way and is so engaged in that. Um, and I think that ultimately, in the ro- long run, that will be a really valuable thing to have more people sort of understand that Biomedical knowledge is created by human beings who are operating in institutions and and science is really this sort of 
messy, very human thing um, that's certainly subject to cultural biases and to missteps along the way. Um, and I think the best thing that the farm industry, as well as really all, all players in, in the medical field can do in this moment is to be really transparent and honest about the sort of history of failures of the past um, and really recognize that, you know, doing better in the future will also require sort of reckoning with the ways that those failures have led to a lot of distrust among some communities um, and not just sort of brushing that aside, but really recognizing that that is really justified just distrust in a, in a lot of realms. I know we could talk about this for hours. It's a critical topic, um, but we do unfortunately have to have to close for today. And I think, you know, what I've heard is that we, we've made some progress, but there's plenty of, of opportunity um, for us to continue to work towards, you know, meaningful, lasting change in this area. The Bristol Myers Squibb Foundation um, is working to increase diversity, um, really industry wide, by training and developing 250 new clinical investigators who are racially and ethnically diverse, or who have demonstrated a commitment to increasing diversity in trials. So there's a six-year program that will also mentor 250 medical students from diverse backgrounds and introduce them to a, a career path in, in clinical research. So I, I know our whole industry has to continue to, to strive to extend the reach of clinical trials to those underrepresented um, patient communities. And if we're going to do that successfully, we have to continue to have conversations like the one we've had here today. You know, we know that we can only be successful if we are truly listening, learning, and evolving our, our, our approaches. So with that, I, I want to sincerely thank you, Aisha and Maya, for your time. Um, for sharing your expertise and, and your experience with, with me and the audience, and for the really very thoughtful discussion here today. So thank you so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thanks.